I'm Paul Nguyen uh, with the University of Washington Clean Energy Institute. This is the Nano Device Physics Lab, and today we are going to grow atomically thin crystals of 2H tungsten diselenide, or WSE2. Uh, here we have a standard single zone tube furnace, which is connected to an oil pump underneath. Um, now, traditional growth uh, using physical vapor transport, or PVT, relies on the furnace's central heating zone to heat uh, source material to sublimation. Uh, the target substrate, where the crystal growth will actually occur, is typically placed away from the center uh, and is heated by the temperature gradient. That is, the temperature of the substrate is controlled by where it's put along the temperature gradient. Uh, this technique is very powerful, very simple, um, by using just solid source as opposed to uh, vapor source, um, and on a lab scale produces many samples for testing and experimentation. Uh, however, for clean energy research, it uh, is missing one core uh, quality, that is scalability. Since you're relying on a temperature gradient, the actual zone or area on your substrate where you will get crystal growth is limited. So today, we're going to actually use uh, a new heating scheme where we have two quartz tubes nested with each other. And in between them, we will have an additional heating coil uh, made from a type N thermocouple that we have simply coiled around at one end. Uh, by driving a high current through it, or a high voltage through it, we're able to actually heat it up to approximately the source sublimation temperature. Uh, then we can use the furnace's uh, temperature controller to actually heat up our substrate, providing a fully uniform growth area. Now we're just going to break down some silicon oxide, which we're going to use as our substrate. Uh, in principle, we could have uh, pretty much as long of a chip as we would, as we, uh, as we want, since we have our nice uniform temperature. Uh, however, for testing purposes, I'm just going to use a short segment. There, I used a diamond scribe to just nick the side, and here. break it apart. Uh, substrate cleanliness we've found to be very important, so we're just going to head over here and clean it with some IPA. Here I'm just using a nitrogen gun to blow away the IPA and whatever contaminants it dissolved. Here we have a quartz inner tube that uh, has obviously been used before. Here we just see the selenium that has been deposited, and we're just going to load our substrate. I happen to know that putting it here will put it very close to the center, and we'll just load it into our outer tube. So here we have the special tube that we're going to use to control the source temperature. Uh, at the end here, we see the coiled thermocouple line. Um, by driving approximately 120, about 100 volts uh, th through the line, this will get to approximately 950 degrees. The tube is made from two nested uh, quartz tubes, and the coil itself is in air, but we will be able to connect the two ends to vacuum and have the source crucible held at the end there. And here's the crucible. Uh, we're going to weigh out about 80 milligrams of tungsten oxide source and 30 milligrams of tungsten selenide source. Uh, the tungsten oxide will provide additional uh, tungsten source um, to our substrate. 
um, since tungsten itself does not sublimate very readily uh, at 950 degrees. It is important that we spread out the source um, to help it sublimate more uniformly and not stop halfway through. Here we are. Right. Uh, now we're just going to cr load the crucible into the tube. Uh, since we want the tungsten oxide to be at a lower temperature, since it sublimates uh, at a much lower temperature than the sol tungsten selenide, we're going to load it first towards the cooler end of our coil. Being very careful not to cause the crucible to tip over. we are. Ready to go. So now it's time to load uh, the crucible tube, uh, making sure the crucible is still right side up. Just going to guide it in, being sure to keep it straight and right side up. I've pre-marked um, the O-ring so that it will end up at the right place. There we go. I'll just close it up. So here we have, we can see our heating coil, the inner tube, and the substrate. And if you pay close attention, the crucible's in there. Um, the furnace will be put at 710 degrees, so the substrate is relatively far away and it should be about that temperature, quite uniformly. And here, uh, about four centimeters away, we have the, uh, the source and the heating element, which will be driven to about 950. Now we connect it to our gas line. This feeds to our flow controllers, which are connected to our gases. Um, right, now uh, we go ahead and connect our thermocouple to both the uh, multimeter and our power supply with this here. Now, due to the low gauge of our thermocouple wire, uh, the power that we put through it will actually cause it to get very hot. In a, in a very, very uh, high-tech uh, solution is to cool the wire. Here, we'll just take a glass of deionized water, which won't conduct if something were to happen to our uh, wire. And we're simply going to submerge 
the wire in it. Now you may ask why we simply do not cut this wire and replace it with um, wire of more common copper wire of higher gauge. Uh, the issue is that the wire supplied is in fact uh, thermocouple wire. If we were simply to cut it and replace it with copper, we would introduce a new uh, type N to copper uh, interface, which would then cause an offset to our readings, um, and then we wouldn't have as high accuracy uh, calibration for our temperature. That seems cool enough. Um, there's also a large metal pot right here, which will also get quite hot. I can't really submerge that in water, so we also have a handy dandy fan, courtesy of an old computer. Once that's together, we'll just go ahead and turn everything on. Power supply, multimeter. Um, this is in fact not reading the thermocouple voltage, but if I go ahead and switch it like that, we can get the actual voltage, which I can read off of this table here. Right. Once that's together, I'll go ahead and turn on the vacuum uh, down here. Bit loud. And open this valve. Uh, our pump should take our system below one millitor or one millionth of an atmosphere. Um, right. Once that's done, I'll go ahead and pump down part of our gas system uh, with this valve. Taking a moment to double check that everything is in place. Chip is right in the middle, right where I want it. Crucible is still right side up. I'll go ahead and close her up. Go ahead and turn on the furnace. Set our timer for just a little bit shorter than the furnace is set up for. Give us a little warning. So it's been uh, two hours. Our system is cooled down. Just let me double check. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn off the pump. Double check that my valves are closed. Great. And to unload, uh, I'm actually going to flow argon back into the, into the chamber to repressurize. Um, that seems good. Over here. this a little bit. So that's fine. Okay. Great. And now we just do everything in reverse. I go ahead and undo the connection. There we go. Take this out of the water. We'll undo the quick connect. And carefully pull out the crucible tube. Good. Still right side up. And using this rod, I'll just pull the substrate tube out. <laughs> there you go. Sometimes it doesn't want to go. Excellent. 
which is in forceps, so I can guide it out. And here we have the substrate uh, on the right side here, or your left. Uh, we can see the discoloration that is indicative of malaria growth. Uh, and now we're going to go to the f microscope and uh, take, a, take a quick look. Now we're just going to look at it uh, with a high power microscope. Here we can see some non-uniformity uh, in the crystal growth and the density. Uh, that may be due to just the heating from the heating coil. Uh, it may have been too close to the substrate. Can I try to find something to look at? 50x, 100x. And here we go. Uh, we see relatively high nucleation from these little spots. Um, that can be controlled with either the, um, the gas flow rate or the, um, the source quantity. But overall, growth looks pretty good. Here we see many very nice triangles, um, which is the optimal structure for these crystals at this size. Here we can see a crystal that's about uh, 35 microns across. And if you look closely at the center there, you can see where it nucleated from. Um, that is very common, but not necessary. Um, for experimentation purposes, I would spend a little time looking around, trying to find a crystal that doesn't have a bulky nucleation center and then we would put it in a device say in a transistor transistor geometry with some contacts and a gate now like graphene WSU2 uh, has all of its molecular bonds in plane so that a single crystal uh, lies just on a single layer, so that bulk material that we're more familiar with is actually just many of these layers held together by van der Waals bonds or van der Waals forces. Um, seen from above, WSU2 has the same hexagonal structure as graphene. Um, however, from the side, we can see that it actually has some of its bonds out of plane, forming a uh, trigonal prismatic uh, structure. Because of this, uh, it and some other transition metal dichalcogenides, um, WSU2 actually becomes a semiconductor as a single layer. This is very important for both uh, optoelectronic and just simple electronic uh, applications, particularly in transistors. Uh, transitions made from this material uh, can be tra transparent, flexible, and uh, really applied to many more situations than traditional transistor technology. Um, and so that was physical vapor transport growth of single-layer WSE2. Thank you for your time.